Okay, I am ready. So, um, <laughs> thank you for getting this set up. And it looks like this week in particular, uh, we've had a lot of little snafus perceived or real uh, having to do with consents. But I think just based on our work, which often has to do with uh, dealing with children who may or may not be able to give their consent, this is something, uh, confusion about the issue is something we see a lot of. So, I wanted to talk about several things. Um, one is uh, just to go over what comprises a reasonable consent. Two is the specific subset of people uh, that we deal with, uh, and that's our majority, are the minors, and which one of them can give consent who can't, and sort of all the permutations of the theme. Uh, when you don't have parents there, but you have various other relatives or friends or divorced parents or you know all these situations, we're kind of often stuck in the middle and don't know what to do. And the way we'll learn this is we'll go through cases which all of us have seen at least one of and we'll discuss it. We don't have a big group on site, but just pretend. <laughs> anyway, Deb will be our group. Okay, so um, I think you all have uh, witnessed uh, physicians trying to get consent. So first of all, who should be getting the consent? Who should be the person who's asking for the consent? Right now, it's the registration. The registration. the registration at the very beginning, but if it's some kind of a procedure, the person who's directly involved. So it rarely is the nurse, right? Um, if the nurse is involved, however, she or he is the witness to a consent, and you should know what constitutes a good one or a bad one. I've certainly listened to some subspecialty residents try to explain a complicated procedure to the family and the family Spanish speaking and they're speaking in English and uh, you know they think that I'm their witness and I realize that all the basic elements of a consent are not there and the, ba the most important element is that you have to be able to explain the risks um, and the advantages of a procedure the alternatives that are available, what the risks and the advantages of alternatives are in a way that is understandable to the patient. So if it's a patient who um, speaks a different language, it should be in that language. If it's a patient who uh, is limited but still can consent for themselves, it should be on their level. Um, and you, as uh, very important providers, I think are in a position where you can say, wait a minute, Dr. X, I don't think they understood that you meant that they're going to cut the leg off or whatever it is that, that is coming. So that's, I think, a big unstated responsibility that um, uh, you have. Uh, for us as a medical team, because we have to be very careful about that. And if the doctor isn't, then it would be very helpful if the nurse uh, could help us stay the line. Um, there are several types of consents. There are simple consents. And just like the word sounds, simple consents are things that, uh, you know, we do every day that don't have a lot of uh, risks or they're kind of mundane. So a blood drop. Yes, you can create a hematoma, um, but it's fairly frequent. An IV, it can infiltrate. You can have a bad side effect from it, but that's considered a routine thing. A cat yes. urine. In our situation, an LP. Uh, we do so many of them in children, it's not usually considered a, um, a very risky thing. So those are simple consents. For those things, it's enough for the doctor to uh, explain the procedure. I am sure typically the doctor leaves the room, the parents turn to you and say, what's going to happen now? Yeah. And, and so, you know, these are things that you can help with. For the more complicated procedures, you need informed consent. Examples of those are transfusions. 
uh, going to the operating room, taking a piece of tissue out, uh, no matter what you're doing. Um, sedation also falls, uh, deep sedation falls also in this category. And I think we were kind of muddy about the way we do that as far as the hospital policy goes, but we do document. We just don't have people sign a separate uh, consent. The important thing is each institution has its own traditions. The Joint Commission doesn't care how you do it, as long as it's written down how you're supposed to do it and that we're consistent and we all know uh, what that means. So uh, to summarize, the person you're talking to getting the consent from has to be able to understand it. It has to have risks and benefits and alternatives. Simple consents are kind of implied. You, as a courtesy, good patient care, you tell people, well, we're going to start the IV. There might be some bleeding, but blah, blah, blah. Uh, informed consent for the more difficult things should be done by the doctor and should be formally documented on the medical record. And a few of the subsets, like surgery or blood transfusions, need separate uh, signatures. So the way we do it in the ED, we have three kind of categories. So if the family comes to triage the usual way, we have them assign the consent uh, for admission and service. And the uh, first and second paragraph there really covers a lot of things and is why we actually don't have to get separate consents for every little thing we do. I mean, if you, uh, you know, looks like I had Parkinson's trying to use the yellow marker. Um, but it basically says, I consent uh, my child for, you know, these procedures, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, blood draws, healthcare services rendered under the general and special uh, instructions of physicians. Then, um, you know, you have the right to refuse. Um, uh, photography is included, um, provided these images can be used for the patient's condition, for surgery, for training, uh, not, uh, oh, this is an interesting rash, I'm going to show my friends kind of thing. But all that is included in our usual written consent. Any comments from our ED leadership about that? No, that's right on. Okay, so that's that. The second way is the child who comes without a guardian and uh, we have to find someone who's responsible and call them on the phone and document it. Um, I actually am not on the front line, so I don't know how often this happens, but Stacey, Teresa, Fran, uh, doing chart audits, I see it happens a pretty good amount. Yeah, I would so, say like, so 10%, 20%, 10%, 10%, yeah, okay. All right. So you can see that the holes in this are like you don't really know who register registration doesn't really know if the person they're talking to is the mother or not. But the law is very forgiving in that they want two things. They want the best for the child and they want you to assume the best if someone is advocating for the child. So even if the person's lying, they don't really have, you know, the official custody, but they say they do, it doesn't matter. I mean, if they are wanting the best for the kid and they give you all this false information, it, you actually are protected uh, by doing your job, getting the telephone consent from this fictitiously related person because you want to do the best thing for the child. So, you know, I think the older we get, the more cynical we are, but actually the law, uh, they want people less than 18 to survive and, and thrive. And basically how that happens is okay. Yeah. Of the situations of um, emancipated minors, um, we will talk about that. We will talk about that. Yes, that's a terror. Anyway, sometimes no consent is required. I think we flail a lot about this. Um, and, you know, it's reasonable to do that because the situation where no consent is required is a life, limb, or health threat. So it's dire. So um, anything that a reasonable person feels would need to be done. Okay, the kid who was struck by a car needs to go to surgery for a laparotomy. 
the extremity that doesn't have a pulse, like we heard at you know various conferences, uh, because it's injured, needs to go to surgery, and nobody can find a parent. The kid with terrible asthma can't breathe. Uh, you know, the kid who choked on a hot dog at school, and nobody can find it. You know. What do we do? We take them to the trauma rooms, we do what needs to be done, they go to the OR, and then then we worry about the parent. And that is what should be done in those situations. Of course, people in the background, the social worker, the registration person, even the charge nurse, and other people, in the meantime, try to find uh, who the real uh, caretakers are. But we're not going to delay care waiting for the consent. So. Uh, any other examples in practice? Yeah, I mean, we see this every day. We've run into what is considered, what you were saying, emergency. Yeah. We ran into one consent situation where it was a minor and the person had asthma. Mm. And she wasn't dying of her asthma. She right. wasn't in severe respiratory distress. And the parent came back later and said, I didn't consent for you to treat my child for asthma. I prefer to do holistic things. You know what I mean? We got, right, right. we got blowback for how we treated her. The prudent right. person, of course, a reasonable right. person, is that we would give an albuterol and right. the patient. Would she die without the albuterol? No. Um, and uh, California law is, for, like you could see, life, limb, we all understand that, but it also says health. Health. And we yeah. prevailed, but it became a question. Yeah, and we should have immunity, and I hope that our that our risk managers support us. Absolutely, we prevail. Yeah. It just made yeah. people question that life and limb thing. Right, right. So, I mean, because you're right. I, I have some examples. Like, well, how near death is this? Uh, you know, how close to the? You know, I can kind of feel the pulse. You know, is that? No. Uh, if you um, you have license to do what you think is reasonable. I mean, this also brings up the question, we know that things change every 20 years in medicine. I know, for example, that when I was a medical student, in all seriousness, I remember going to the bedside of these old people and saying, you know, salmon is a very fatty fish. You shouldn't eat it. It's bad for your heart. Well, and this is what we thought. So there might be some things that we do now that we think I don't know, albuterol, that we think are essential that in 20 years, people will say, oh yeah, in, in, uh, in the mid-2000s, people used to you know, give albuterol. So uh, things change, but for, to the best of our ability, the state-of-the-art knowledge, we think albuterol is necessary for respiratory distress. This is what we use. We are protected. We have immunity um, in the law. Okay, so the things that need consent in RED are generally under snapshot in EPIC, and this is an example of a bad slide uh, because you can't possibly read it. But if you look under the snapshot, there is a category called consents and forms, and all the things on there generally uh, need a consent that is signed. So you print that out and you sign it, and things like transfusions are on there, um, what is on there, you know, stuff that we don't usually do. Acupuncture is on there. Uh, that's my little baby, and I, uh, it, you know, we, we do that anyway. So you can see all this stuff. Lumbar puncture is not on there. Is laceration repair? I'm looking. I didn't see it. No, no, no it's not on there. No. So it doesn't require consent. It, doesn't, it requires a consent, like me talking to the family and documenting it on that procedure part of EPIC, which often has discussed with the patient or the parent. But it doesn't require printing this, having them sign it, giving it to the clerk so they could scan it in and put it in the media tab. Because not to hijack, but along oh. that asthma, laceration yes. repair has been an issue as well. Oh, and okay. It's been where they're at a field trip. Yeah. A kid's at a field trip. Right. And the kid falls down and gets a laceration, a cosmetic laceration. Let's okay. just say that. And the teacher, the person who has that field trip consent, brings in the kid and says, well, yeah, the reasonable person under health or whatever right. would suit yeah. your like laceration. laceration. Yes. Right? And the parents have gone berserk and said, I would have gotten plastic surgery. I'd have gone to my private doctor. I don't like that that 
first year residents, so did I. Well, that's an inter you know that's an interesting point. I think we're safe with that, but I will uh, you know I, I I will ask specifically about that because that has come up. I got yeah. a giant avalanche in Alameda about this exact thing. Very interesting. Because starting when my children started school, yeah, on that consent or field trips, yeah, I would say life and death only is what I would sign. To do well, you know, uh, maybe that is, uh, I think we're protected uh, because, you know, how is the teacher supposed to uh, figure I didn't that want out? The but you're right. Take them to San Ramon Region. Well, right, right. Or to some, yeah, you're, you're absolutely. So I don't know uh, in that. I think we would be protected, but uh, being protected is not the same as, I mean, you'd still have to meet a hundred hours with administrators mm -hmm. and the well, risk manager and, like and everybody else. For a bad outcome. Even if you consent, they right. say, I would have gotten a different clinic. Right. I don't know. It's just, those are the consents that get yeah, asked. That's, uh, well, that's an interesting, uh, I, I'll ask that, that to see in the next permutation of this lecture. Uh, if, if I'll, I'll have that, but for right now, we're, no, we're good. I mean, I think we get the concept. It just, those yeah. ones are not going to die if you don't suture that up in four hours. Right. You know, exactly. Exactly. That is true. That is true. Uh, yeah. But how would you know? Because some parents would be more than happy that you did it. And some parents, uh, you know, if you look at the zip code and decide that, <laughs> of course not. You can't. Yeah. Right. But and unless you write something very specific like I did, no teacher in the right I right. right. taking one of my kids to an ER. So elected by, okay, that's an interesting. Okay, who can give consent? So I kind of alluded to this. Obviously, the parent who actually has custody, not the parent who's, well, the, the, if a child is a foster parent, it depends what the court has decided about medical custody with the child, right? So these are things, um, the domestic partner of a parent, only if the court has awarded them that right. Babysitters, if there already is a little note from the parent saying they can do whatever they need to do. When they're divorced, if they have uh, joint custody and one parent doesn't want it and the other parent wants it, if it's not life threatening, you theoretically can't do the procedure until they agree. Um, it, OPD makes a decision if the youth is in custody because they have the court ordered uh, uh, documentation. But I think in all of these cases, again, if it's life-threatening, it doesn't matter who has custody. We, we do it. If it's not life-threatening, we call social service and we try to figure it out. And if it's one of these things like the facial lack, let's say, so theoretically 12 hours before horrible scarring. So it's 11 and a half hours since the kid fell on the field trip, but they had to get back from Yosemite and, you know, that's how long it took. Well, I think you can, in fact, sew it up then. But if it's two hours and you've got another, you know, nine hours before the 12 hours or, or, or is over, then you have uh, the ability to find the family. And the decision, like I think the nurse and the doctor should talk about this, and I'm sure that registration would, uh, and the charge nurse and the primary nurse would bring this to the attention of the uh, treating doctors, right? I mean, but so if, who can give consent is kind of immaterial in an emergency case. And when, um, you know, it's not emergent, then you have to have the legal guardian. Um, this is what people are supposed to sign ahead of time that shows them that the grandmother, in fact, has the rights to make a decision for the child. And this is also a good faith thing. She just kind of signs it. You really don't check to see if she has any kind of court thing that says, yes, she's in charge. Okay, who's a minor? When can they consent for himself or herself to speak to your stuff, Deb? So, so going back to the consent of the, the grandma, what do you mean that they should sign that ahead of time? Like have a piece of paper that they give to grandma that they present to the ED? Right. I mean, it should be that the, if the grandmother, say, takes the kids during the day while the parents are working, the grandmother should have um, um, should have this consent affidavit. But if she doesn't, 
our registration, this form is from our uh, administrative manual. Our registration people could give her that form and she could fill it out. And what it says on it is that, you know, the, the, the um, mother or the, the legal guardian uh, gave me permission to take care of this child and I uh, bring the child in and I'm making the medical decisions in lieu of the parents. And, you know, you're never going to okay. know if that's true or not, right? You are just going to have yeah. to trust. But the law supports us because, you know, we we are doing something for the life, limb, or health of the child. So it's um, okay. it's very lenient as far as we go. And I think okay. if the mother and the grandmother later, the mother said, how dare you take my child to children's? So those two would could possibly have a legal interaction, but not us. Um, okay. Who is who is yes, speaking? Kim Rock. Oh, Kim. I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen you, Kim, let alone heard you in a long time. Anyway, okay. Um, who is a minor when they can consent? Okay. So, um, anybody uh, 12 or over can consent to outpatient mental health they can't be put into a mental hospital without their parents but they can get outpatient mental health any kind of sti hiv drug or alcohol stuff and uh, they get hipaa protection and that is one of the reasons we have the option to send the abs home with a child by printing a limited sensitive abs that doesn't have you know, specific diagnoses on it. And theoretically, um, well, the law, the law um, allows them to get a bill uh, for it. So eventually the parents find out. It used to be that they could not get a bill for it, but the law allows them to get a bill unless the pediatrician ahead of time has made arrangements to get them on one of these grants, which of course doesn't happen most of the time. But if the, um, if the mother calls up later and says, Johnny was here in the, he said he was in the emergency department and I want to know why, uh, we can't tell them why they were here and because they can consent for themselves. Yes. If it's one of these, if it's one of these things. Yes. If they fell down the ladder and broke their leg, that's a different story. Yes. Okay. But th this has been a big thing. People, uh, you know, the nurses who have children this age are like, this is preposterous. You mean my 13 year old is not, you know, just finished eighth grade and is not even in high school and is going to be in the ED and getting treatment for who knows what. And I won't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's the California law. So when they call when the parent <clears throat> calls on the phone and asks if I heard um, my child's there. Oh, yeah, we have some you cases do. about that. Well, we have some cases about that, so hold that thought down. How, how about the child who comes to the, not the child, the minor with a child? Can, is she, is oh, she? Oh, I got questions about that. Okay, I got all the things. Okay, uh, any age minor, nine-year-old, can, can, can consent for reproductive health. I would like birth control. I thought it had to be up. You mean up to any age? Any age. It's okay. any age. However, we're going to talk about that. You have to ask how old the partner is. Yeah. Oh, that's right. They, oh, because they can't. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they want reproductive care and the partner is 15, even, and they're not, you know, that's terrible. That's okay. <laughs> emancipated. So this is an uh, emancipated minor can consent for all their care. So that is a person who's legally married, uh, in active duty, or who can prove because they have a DMV card or um, a little notice uh, that they have been living independently of their parents, and therefore they also sign all the forms that say they're going to take care of all the bills. And I don't know that we, and anybody over 18, of course, can sign for themselves. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, if a runaway is living independently of their parents, yes. 
thing. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing. Are they going to have to have a card? No, the fact that they're runaway. Well, I'm thinking that's what I have to do. No, um, they don't, they just have to be independent. The official documentation is that they have a card. I might have a picture. Uh, this is the self-sufficient minor attestation, and they signed this again. They signed this in registration. So how do you how do you prove it? You don't, right? Uh, so it's an interesting thing. And I use the example of runaway, but they probably wouldn't admit to us they're a runaway. Yeah, because then we call the yes, social worker. That's right. But if they if they you know, if they not theoretically, if they are actually living independent of their parents and couch surfing with friends or whatever. We sometimes see these kids who, where do you live? I live at my girlfriend's house and I don't, you know. So I don't know if I live in my girlfriend's house and the girlfriend's mother feeds them and she doesn't, you have to be financially taking care of your financial affairs. So I, you know, I think sometimes these are quite loose. Yeah. Um, I'll ask about this. Um, but the overall gist of what I'm hearing you say is that they sign the paper, they attest to that they're independent and we take them out of it. Right. And legally, we're protected. You can't sit there and say you're a liar, I'm not. Right, lying. exactly. Or I'm, I'm gonna have to prove it. Yeah. Now, we probably, uh, again, if uh, something was a life threat, we have a case like that, then we would um, we would do whatever we needed to do anyway. I mean, yeah. We would disregard them, right? I mean, it's kind of, so it's like we let them have the rope, even if it's not deserved, as long as they're not hurting themselves. And we are protected. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. So if it needs an LP, resident explains the procedure to the family. Does a separate consent need to be signed? Well, we know that in our institution, no. A lot of the residents who come from other hospitals say, well, really, you don't sign a consent, even UCSF. So that's, uh, that's a little different, but we don't need to in the ED. And what about blood transfusions? Yes, IND, no, no for photos, and this, Oh, no, with the photos? Is that what no, you said? No, we do not have that. I mm -hmm. talked to Denise Joyce, and it's in our signing thing. What kind of photos? Uh, for training, for documenting it's epic. I thought you meant, okay, that's fine. Yeah, no, no, so when I was making my pictures, uh, my, you know, aesthetic pictures for my Berkeley photo course, of course I got uh, permission. Yes. Any kind of marketing thing as well. Yes, any marketing, any non-medical use, non-medical or non-medical teaching. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The recent video we did, I got a consent for anyone that got near the front of the camera. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a great. Okay. Did right. I answer the, I know I stepped out for a second, there is a code green, which is kind of hilarious that a code green on a 20-year-old I thought it's like oh, that's interesting. interesting. Well, unless they're medically, I know, but I just thought that was interesting. Yes, very interesting uh, from the consent point of view. Twenty-year-old yeah. is a graduate from high school. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's different. Very interesting. I know. So they're looking for him. He's um, just missing. So, what did you decide about? You you answered about um, the well, the the, if a kid says they're independent, there is a form that they can sign. It's this one from Triage Self-Sufficient Minor Attestation. Again, they are signing it at triage, right? For so we don't have to prove. No, but we have a child, a ch an 18 month old, mm -hmm. a 15 year old, mm -hmm. that's the mother, parent of the 18 year old, right. and the 35 year old grandma. We're going to have a situation. No, a self sufficient is financially independent. Is right. not, so has the 15 year old cannot consent to or not. It, Correct. Yes. Okay, it has nothing. This is the you know the the teenage boy uh, like um demarie when he was 15. yes he didn't live at home uh you know he had his own little job or whatever he did and and uh, you know he consented for his own care so and what i was what teresa and i were talking about is as long as you're kind of doing the right thing, you don't question them, or I don't believe you, or you know, prove it. You don't have a DMV card. Um, yeah. The law specifically states that you are not 
um, you're not encouraged to try to have them prove it and delay it. Uh, you know, because you're doing the right thing for them. It's uh, you're allowing them license to get care, and 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 they will be financially liable for all the care that they get. Okay, resident finishing a lap repair, Denning's doing a sedation, resident asks you to explain the LP to the family of this patient. And the resident says, see, you've been here much longer than I have anyway, I know the risks and benefits much better. So is this okay? No. Not really. No. Uh, so what I would want to communicate to my nursing colleagues is, is absolutely, you are not, you, you have to talk to the attending and some doctor needs to get the consent. So what if the primary caretaker isn't there? The patient requires an urgent but not emergent procedure. The attending tells you, Teresa, I spoke to the mom on the phone and she gave her consent. So what are you supposed to do? There's, you have to have two people. Yes. So you, in our policy, our hospital policy says that you, Fran, can then call the mom back I understand you spoke to Dr. Shalise just a few minutes ago about the procedure. I just need to verify, blah, blah. So that's okay. But ideally, we both should be on the phone at the same but time. But it doesn't have to be simultaneous. But it doesn't have to be. But you do have to, our policy says you do have to call and kind of make sure. I have to hear it with my own ears. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then you document it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, what is this? This is consent's policy. Patient specific consents may, oh, I need to make this bigger so that. Well, what what is it say? 19, right? Oh, this is, oh, basically, this is, you can do anything. Wait, what does it's, it say? Second paragraph. Legal and ethical duty to obtain consent prior to medical treatment, except cases perceived to be an emergency. Yeah. Patient specific, the second. Paragraph. Yes. Patient specific consents may need to be obtained in the ED. They can be obtained from the ethical electronic medical record under the snapshot activity. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think this is one version before I cleaned it up. So this is just all this says is basically, uh, you know, where you can get in. We already saw these these extra little consents and that an emergent case does not. Oh, this is okay. Look at this one. This is from our nursing emergency nursing stuff. Specific consent for the procedure not required verbal for the lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. Verbal consent following a discussion, which even our risk manager wasn't entirely clear about. It's because inpatient, they get consent for lumbar puncture. Right, right. Oh, and, and they do in a lot of EDs, but we but not, do so relatively many. I mean, maybe not these years that we're tapping in general less. But you do have reasonable documentation in EPIC, even though you don't find that, you know, parents uh, somewhere in there. I thought it said, well, I think actually in this one, in the sedation one, it does say who you talk to. In this one, it does not. I think you definitely have to say what you're going to do. Yeah, you do have to say it, but I think this consent documentation in EPIC for an LP does not have, I spoke to the parent. Um, it does in the sedation one. It definitely Yeah, does. in the sedation one. In this one, it does not. So, you know, it is kind of weird, but, but we do, the residents generally do. Okay, here's, all right, pregnant girl comes in with a painful ingrown toenail, which she wants treated. Her mom is not reachable. So this is, you know, the case we kind of all brought up. Why did I put this in there? Well, this is not, okay. So patient is a minor. She really can't consent for herself. In an emergency, which is determined by the medical screening exam, when the consent can be obtained, it's implied. Allows providers to save the life, limb, or health of the patient. Providers have immunity. Law is applicable, blah, blah. So then you have to decide um, whether, uh, you know, you can, so I think, you know, you could say, well, that toenail is going to affect her health, but you could also say, well, you know what, this is really not an emergency. So I think we have a lot of leeway. And frankly, I think if the place were falling apart and we had other things that were really worrisome, we would say, you know what, 
this is not really an emergency. Oh, you can go see Dr. Kim. Yeah. Oh, no, you have to medically screen everyone. Yeah. <coughs> I think I screwed up this presentation. This is not the way I. Okay, let's do this next case. So she comes in three months later with her newborn who has a fever. She tells you her other foot hurts, and now you see the second ingrown toenail. So, which is the right answer? She can consent for the baby's fever workup, but not for herself. You can't fix her second ingrown toenail. She can consent for the baby and herself since she's now a parent. She can consent only for herself since she's no longer pregnant. <laughs> so the right answer is A. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> years ago, they used to say that if you were pregnant, if you've had a baby or a pregnant, right. years ago, they used to say you were emancipated. Right. You were no longer it's not. emancipated just because you've given birth. Correct. And that is the thing. Right. Now, if you're living by yourself with your boyfriend, uh, you don't have to be married, but you're financially independent, yes, you're an emancipated minor. You can decide for yourself. Okay, what about this one? Same 14 year old girl comes um, and the newborn has a fever. She tells you her other foot hurts. Now you see the second in her toenail. The teen's mom is in the room. You discuss an LP for the infant with the teenager. The teenager absolutely refuses the workup, but the grandmother says, go ahead and do it. We've had that. Yes. Or you discuss the LP uh, for the infant with the teenager. The teen agrees, but the grandmother says, no way. Yeah, we've had that too. Have you watched that show, Unexpected? No. It would clarify your life. <laughs> really? Yeah, because it's all about this, this kind of stuff. The teen mom living with her mom who's the age of where mom, it's, grandmother, and great grandmother all live together because they're all under fifty, basically. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, and the same thing happens when they go right, home. right. So basically, if the kid needs an LP and we need to do it, it doesn't matter what they say. We we get social worker, we can get CPS, and we can do the LP. What we usually do is we try to pick our battles and say, you know, somehow it was hard to get through to either of these people. We would uh, talk to social work. We would probably give the, come up with some palatable alternative, like give the kid antibiotics and admit them, or just admit them, or something. But basically, we would do what we have to do for the kid. But theoretically, uh, only the child, only the teenager, can consent for her baby. Uh, the grandmother cannot. So. Uh, you know, we'd have to work on, on both of them. If the kid needed it for life threat reasons, we would go ahead and do it. Okay, 12-year-old girl comes in with her mom, abdominal pain and bloating. She's been having irregular periods for about a year. The beta HCG is positive. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have issues about this because they have kids this age, and what do you mean? You can't tell the mother, but you can't tell the uh, mother of this child that she's pregnant. And we've gone through this a lot. We get the social worker and I think 99% of the time we can, after three hours, convince the child to tell her mother and, and that it's a reasonable thing. So she comes in, uh, wait a minute, okay, that's all right. Oh, this is where if you have a young uh, child who's either pregnant or wants birth control or something like that, you have to ask the age of the partner. And if um, you look on this algorithm and uh, in California, if you have a 13 year old child who is having sex with a 14 year old, that child has a mandated uh, report to uh, uh, child Protective Services made. Uh, if the child is, you know, you can see that CJ means clinical judgment, mandated means mandated, and basically, you know, you only have a few years leeway usually, uh, either way. I mean, it's interesting that somehow the 14-year-old can, um, so the 14-year-old can't have sex with the 12-year-old or 13-year-old, but clinical judgment on having sex with 14 to 20 year olds. Uh, I mean, I, it would have been it's very difficult. Specific. So no, you can be, you know, that's so, a good point. That, I was thinking thing this, thing this is, is, is very thing. interesting. You got the 20 year old girl with the 15 year old boy. He yes. is not allowed to be having sex with her. 
hello teacher. Well, the age of partner, so it doesn't matter. So 50, yeah, I see what, That's what I just said. So 50, yeah, clinical judgment. Yeah, well, I guess the clinical judgment me. is very, yeah. He explained it to me as age difference is an issue as well. So yeah. a 20 year old woman and a 15 year old boy, man, young kid, mm -hmm. whatever, that would be not, it's reportable because of the age difference for one. Well, according to this, it's clinical judgment. Well, it's that's not. I think that's, yes. but I mean, he uses that as, right. To that's it, well, that's a very good, judgment. you know, okay, we're going to change this so but that we the, have this part of the discussion. This particular graph, the M's Never mandated, the mandated means that's a legal thing. You have yes, to you have to report this is, it. doesn't matter. Uh, I kind of, you know, he's my 13 year old boyfriend. I mean, you would think a 14 year old patient having sex with, uh, I mean, we're not talking should they be having sex at all, but, but a 13 and a 14 year old having sex with each other, you'd think like, well, who cares? Yeah, yeah. who cares? I mean, yeah. other than, yeah, I mean, you know, know. both might be in eighth grade or right. ninth grade, right. and, but it's mandated. So, interesting. Uh, he explained all this to me and I can't remember why. Who, who did? It? Jim Crawford. Oh, Jim Crawford. He okay. exactly. You know what? I'm going to have to. Okay. Uh, this is okay. This is a very good thing. Okay. 14 year old comes in by herself to complain of abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding. Her point of care urine, uh, beta HCG is positive. Ashcon diagnosis on ectopic. The Alton Bates OB floor has accepted her. Which of the following is true? Unless she's hemodynamically unstable, the ambulance cannot transfer her without the mother's consent. Well, she's pregnant, so she can it's not one yeah, anyway. Nine Patient can consent for herself and be taken by ambulance without further ado. Yes. If she's unstable, yes. The patient can consent for herself, and if she refuses transport, you have no recourse but to sign her out, AMA. And actually, we have a trauma policy. I think I gave you the wrong thing. Okay, look at this. It is the responsibility of the patient's physician to fill out the da 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 da. If the guardian consent is obtained, okay, but if the parent's consent cannot be obtained for transfer, a transfer is considered an emergency, like an ectopic that's bleeding, and you have to go to all debates. The physician must document on the transfer consent form that it was considered emergent, and out she goes. And so you can do this without the parents' consent. Right. Well, she do it anyway because she's she's a minor, and she can only consent for her unborn baby, which is not yet born and is not a baby yet. is is a fetus. So in her situation, her medical consenting must be done by her legal guardian, and the guardian is not there, so she can't really say she's not going to all the base. You know, I don't. I'm sure we've had these situations. We definitely. Have. What do we do? We, do we do this? I mean, this is what our policy is. We transfer. Yeah. I mean, and I, I wonder, you know, like if I was the receiving hospital, I guess, you know, she's pulling out the IV, she's refused. But well, let's presume that she's hemodynamically. And of course, we'd have everybody talking to her and trying to convince and her. And how far along, how pregnant is she? Right, exactly. That. If she's impending delivery, She's right. not making decisions on behalf of herself or her unborn child. Right. That, and so someone has to protect the unborn child. I mean, there's a whole big right. thing. Right. Um, well, if, if she's unstable and it's a life threat, and most ectopics would be considered that, she has to go whether she wants to or not. And in the other situations, it's the AMA form. And that's our, that's our AMA policy and basically you know, I think if the patient is stable and you document that, you can uh, have them sign on AMA. It's not a good protection. But no, it's not worth the paper it's written. And this is a whole other lecture, but we have a lot of problem with the like accident victim parent of the child oh. who comes in and needs treatment but refuses transfer. Yep. Oh, yeah. So that's not really a consent issue, but it's along those lines of the AMA form and whether or not we actually do the treatment for somebody. Sure. Who who them so yeah. We can't provide them, you know, right. their neck hurts and they just kept their seatbelt thing on there. Yeah. But we've had that and they're not, then we consider that they're not making decisions right. on it. It's, it's less 
traumatic trauma. It's worse if it's a stroke. Of course. And they're refusing care, and then one could argue they're not making appropriate mental decisions. Right. And that this happened to us with someone. Well, I'll ask recently. that. I mean, it's great to have this discussion, which I presume there's not a huge audience, but we can we can uh, revamp this a little for uh, you know for these real situations and get some input. We wouldn't want anyone to act independently on these without no, re you know, that's a very consulting. Yes either the attending, the manager on call. And the attending in situations situation. like this should not work independently. No one should be acting independently. Right. Yes. So the reason uh, I got motivated to write this lecture is because one of our one of our longtime nurses and I had a disagreement about a patient like this. And uh, I think a lot of people would have had a disagreement because uh, she had children this age and okay 17 year old boy attended seems drunk brought in by his friends a woman who says she is his mom calls asked to speak to his nurse marianne pages you overhead you answer the phone the woman asks what's wrong with my son and although the boy's vitals are stable and he can maintain his airway the top screen has come back positive for marijuana and his alcohol is through the roof so what can we say what do we so the the person in question identified uh, very strongly with the mother uh, she herself had been through a similar situation and i think uh fully recognized so you can tell the mom everything. He's, your son was using marijuana, he's drunk, he'll be better when he sleeps it off. You tell the mom her son is here, he is stable, she should come in and see what's happening herself. You tell the mom that according to California law, you can't tell her anything about her son's condition. I think most of us would have pity on the frantic parent on the line and do B. But the ideal thing is you have to have see we can't tell her anything but i always say when i'm trying to reinforce this is when you do b or a the parent holds it together brings the kid home beats the crap out of them at home and they come back to us as a trauma stat full oh that's a great great and that's more the person on the phone is not the mother. well that too right and that is, saying, that is the big point how do you know well you don't you're not allowed even if it was consent of old blah 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 mm -hmm. it's you you cannot, it's, it, Jim Crawford told me this too, that you do on what you think is the prudent parent. Would right, exactly. And they hold it together till they get home and their naughty kid is well, this the, the prudent time. parent, however, and th this breaks down a little because I think most prudent parents would be like, what do you mean? I, you know, the kid's like, like, what do you mean you can't tell me? You know, is he? Is he alive? Is he there? Is he, you know? Yeah, but then they come yeah. in and they're mad at you, the clinician, for not right. telling him. They could shoot you. And then they also take the child home and discipline them how they see fit. But I, I would say, so, you know, I, I, I see what you're saying. I would find it hard not to tell the mother of that course, he's stable. That. He's stable, but you have to come in. I think the bigger thing, too, is um, he was out all night. And he ends up, you, right. know, like you hear stories where mom's called five ERs trying to look right, at Right, exactly. And she's in misery. Right, right. I mean, but I think to tell her that he's stable with nothing else, you know, I would probably do that, frankly. Although, by law, you have to say, see, like, sorry, ma'am, I can't really tell you anything. Because of what you're saying. Is, it kind of says a lot. C yeah. says, I know your kid's here. Is kind of what C right. says. Right, because the answer to that is in the absence of I can't tell you anything by California law. Most people, Marianne, would say I don't see him on the board, so the parent would move on. Right, to call out the base. <laughs> right. What also seems a little bit contradictory is that we're able to call the parent or registration and confirm their yeah. identity for right. our team. Right. yeah, but we're not able to give out information and confirm it that way. But not in a sensitive service like that. Yeah, and no, it's a very, yes, and that's, that's
sensitive, Kim, this is a sensitive service. So I don't know oh, these are great. Okay. I think we're going to tune this talk up. <laughs> we're going to tune it up. Presumably, if he gets brought in by his friends, we're getting his name and birthday. And stuff. Okay, well, Close there's enough one to with the his person. friends. There's one with his friends. Kid. But here's another. Okay. That's so he's that. mildly intoxicated this time. He's brought in by his friends. He tells you he's been drinking at the prom and asks you not to tell the parents. A woman who says he's his mom calls and asks to speak to the nurse. It's the same old thing. Marianne pages you. And uh, so what do you what do you say now? So this was actually the scenario. Uh, the child was not. So. You know, this is kind of the same thing. Uh, it's absolutely the same thing. And he asked, so some people argue that in the first scenario, the kid was unconscious and, you know, was kind of like in a dire strait. And of course, the parent needs to know about it. The parent needs to know the kid's in a dire strait if they're in a dire strait. And then, uh, you know, if they come in, you truly don't know, they call and, and the child, um, you know, is doing badly, you ask the parent to come in, then you can talk about marijuana and you can talk about the alcohol and all that stuff, you know, in a life threat uh, situation where, you know, he's being intubated and the blood pressure is falling and all that stuff. But uh, the first scenario wasn't that bad and this scenario definitely, I mean, the kid asked you not to tell him. And if you, um, they can actually sue uh, the nurse and the hospital if you, if you tell. So uh, I, I think the answer to the first case and the second case is you really can't open on anything but ask her to come in. What about this one? I had this one. Okay, same kid. Uh, he's brought in by his friends. He sleeps off the alcohol and the marijuana and uh, he's ready to go home. Friends say they can drive him. So is the answer, you can send him home with his friends because he came with them. He can't go home until his parent is contacted and they, the parent gets consent to let the friends uh, drive home or can, he can't go home until the legal guardians come to get him. B is the answer really. You can, if the, if the parent, uh, again, do you believe that the person you're talking to on the phone is not the older sister versus the parent? But if you document that they say that, you know, they know who these people are and can drive home, then fine. But you can't say, well, you know, he came with them, so he probably can go home. What so in this case, you call up the parents. Yes. And you say your son is our ever in our mm -hmm. emergency department. You'll have to talk to him about why he's here. But is it okay with you if his friends drive yes. home? Yes. Okay. Isn't that, isn't that? And if you're a savvy parent, you probably, then your antenna are up and you know exactly why he's there. You're so. in your own car. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I went over all of these with the, okay, 70, seven month old baby sustained a fracture lower leg. You suspect maybe non accidental. Dr. Crawford suggests a skeletal survey, but the parents absolutely refuse because they want, don't want to subject their baby to that much radiation. And they can't, uh, even if it's just a small suspicion of non accidental trauma, uh, the doctor has the right to do it. And I guess, you know, if we have problems, then social service, the sheriff, everybody else. But we have the right to do anything that requires evaluation of non-accidental trauma and keeping the patient safe. So you don't have to like do a court order and all this other stuff. You can just say, no, you can just say, sorry. Have we ever had this happen where they didn't want to do it? I imagine we have, but I don't know if any that didn't get to yes, as Stacey would say, eventually. <laughs> I don't know. Not that yeah. I can think of. It's kind of, well, this is another get to yes situation. Divorced parents, shared custody, kid has appendicitis, Dr. Betts wants to do surgery, mom agrees, dad has recently been reading about the antibiotics uh, in Europe, and he thinks the anesthesia risk is too high, he doesn't. Well, you know, medicine is changing about this thing, and I think you do try social work and all of that, but ultimately, if appendectomy was absolutely necessary, the kid would go to the OR and you would decide this later.
Yes. Unless you have to get a court order if they can't agree. Well, if the kid is, you know, if it's a ruptured ampy, the kid's hypotensive, it's, if it's a life threat, the kid can go. But if it can wait, because now antibiotics are, some people actually do antibiotics, then, you know, it would be a social service, but uh, Denise decide. Joyce nurse administrator on call or administrator on call. It's definitely happened with diabetic care. Oh, really? Yeah. Like what? Like what? Like, I don't, I don't think, you know, like a DKA not treated. Well, that's extremis. Yeah. yeah. Or like, I don't think he needs insulin. I think we can control his diet. Parents don't agree. Oh, um, treatment course. I don't think he needs to be admitted. I can take him home. He just didn't take his shots. I can take care of it. So there's definitely, I've heard that before, and that's consent for admission more than consent for treatment, yeah. really. Um, I just know that, I mean, the yeah, appendicitis thing, I've seen it, it, most of the time parents will agree at the end. At the end. When you threaten to do nothing, they'll agree. If you have two parents that will not agree, and don't you then kind of have to find two physicians that agree? Listen, so well, you have to get a court order. Um, you do not. So that's what Dr. Betts thought. Denise Joyce, because um, uh, we talked about this kind of at the trauma m and &M, I was going over a case like this, but you don't, uh, Denise Joyce says you don't need uh, two physicians. You just need one. Yeah, you just need okay. one to say that this is kind of a life threat. But these people in the room, physicians were saying it's going to be hell freezes over before they take somebody against their will. Right. Well, uh, that's true. If I were the, even if you're right, you know, this family is going to sue or whatever it's going to be. So I think it, I don't, you know, if the kid were hypotensive and he were dying, nobody well, would care. They no, would just starts. take it. It's the one. Right. That it's the, but this one probably can in fact wait for Denise Joyce to come down and for there to be yeah. whatever safety stat or something, whatever would happen. So, what would you tell your nurses? I would ask them to talk to to call the administrator on call. I would ask them to get the medical legal person, not them. What? Tell the attending, call the manager on call. Oh, okay. Like, could they call the person for me? I could say to the charge nurse, please call. And yeah. then you or Teresa can get the And the nursing role. supervisor is another one who is in a leadership role. But see, I think this needs, the ED is falling apart. Everybody's doing well, that's why the nurse needs and you need the legal person. That's right. The supervisor yes. calls the administrator on call as well as the legal okay. person. I think that would be the most streamlined way and not a lot of telephone. So, and that said, the day that I needed it for the um, autopsy or, or for the oh, yeah, that's coroner's right. case, oh, we don't have a legal person on call. I know, today. but you call me, but yeah. I know, but I, I just think yeah, there's holes in this. Thing. There's huge holes in the legal thing. Yeah. I've tried for hours and hours and hours to get a hold of them yeah. before. It's not at all hard to get a hold of the administrator on call. Right. You definitely will drill down and do that. That's always right. Okay. Right. Well, so when we rebut this, it's we sad. should. It's we should. <laughs> and I was going to say the, the administrator on call, say our risk manager is in Europe. We have at least now the West Bay risk management yeah. people. There's, there's so the administrator on call would have a contact for sure. Um, it's, it's a thing, but you got to get to a correct answer. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, we'll redo these things because we'll give it. And we have had um, one parent insist on going to a different hospital and one saying this hospital's fine. And that's happened to say. Oh, God. Well, this is the Jehovah's Witness. And this is the kid who's anemic because he drinks too much milk and he oh, yeah. needs a transfusion, but he looks basically fine. So he also is a social service kind of thing and, you know, get Howard Rosenfeld involved and... Uh, do this sort of semi-electively, but the kid who um, is a full trauma and is unconscious and his belly is blowing up and he needs a transfusion, he's going to get a transfusion. And it doesn't matter, uh, you know, you, you will try to respect them as much as possible. But my experience with this is the family is relieved that you take it away from them and uh, you are the one that made the sin and not them. Um, 
Okay. Oh, this one I didn't even remember. A 13-year-old comes in by himself from school. He's got, oh, this I added. I didn't think I'd have a long enough presentation. Uh, because of abdominal pain and persistent vomiting, he confides in triage that he's been vaping marijuana daily for the past two months. It helps his anxiety and that he feels like he's kill he feels like killing his very strict and overbearing dad. So the issues are, well, he's a minor, but he does have this drug thing that should be confidential. On the other hand, the fact that he's got a homicidal ideation uh, puts all confidentiality out the window. Yeah, I mean, true, consent for himself uh, if another person is in danger. So obviously you call a bird. Then I just wanted to go over this because I think we're seeing a lot mm -hmm. and how the characteristics are and some of the things that help are the, the capsaicin uh, cream that you use for muscle aches and pains that specifically targets the vomiting receptor, uh, CB1 vomiting receptor. Where do you so put it? on the abdomen usually or on the outside arms and any area that otherwise the person likes to have the hot water from the showers on oh because that's the other treatment showers of 41 you know degrees. they've seen the capsaicin put on um, abdomens that have not seen the light of day oh yeah and it causes an inflammatory it's like putting hot pepper well but that is the point. Yeah, but it causes the skin problem. Oh, well. I've seen dermatitis, contact okay. dermatitis, it's bad. So most of these are boys, they all have nausea and vomiting. We had a girl the other day who had come in three times, had a complete workup each time. And basically what the history turned out to be, and I didn't think of this myself, it was uh, one of the Highland residents. Oh. Cannabis hyper. Well, of course, yes, she's vaping every day because she's anxious. And, uh, you know, the only thing that really cures it is stopping it. But uh, they, the other thing in the history is they use their family's hot water completely because they stay in these showers for hours um, and it's cyclic. And they keep coming back and fluids, Zofran, but most importantly, Haldol. Uh -huh. That really calms them down. And now ketamine, I guess, you know, ketamine is used for everything. And then the capsaicin cream, you know, just tells you our pharmacy doesn't have it. But that's the capsaicin? Yeah, it's sold everywhere. No, I know it is. I know it is. But for our ED to like put it on, it doesn't matter. So, anyway. Well, that's it. And cut it at the